this, um, our opening uh, piece is um, the Ishtar Gates, which are now in Germany, but they've, they're one of the oldest examples of outdoor clay. Uh, they live their life mostly in weather of extremes and have made it uh, to live inside of a museum. But uh, the guys that are here on our panel today uh, have a lot to offer. I've done some outdoor sculpture, but I've not done as uh, Brad has done even more than I. And these other two guys are a lot smarter than I am. So I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, the rest of the panel has to say. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, get to my notes here. Brad Evan Taylor is a current professor of ceramics at the University of Hawaii, Mao, Honolulu. He has MFA earned at um, New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University, is, was awarded in 1992. Since that time, he has been active maker, exhibitor, and teacher, both nationally and internationally. He is a member of the International Academy of Ceramics. Dr. William Carney is a John F. Malrin Professor, Chair of Ceramic Engineer, if I said that right, at Alfred University and has been at Alfred since 1993, 24 years. Bill teaches ceramic science uh, for the Artist Workshop in the summer. He has been attending in Sika for the past 15 years and, and this is his ninth presentation. John B. Krauss, President and General Manager of Boston Valley Terracotta, holds a BS in Ceramic Engineering, a minor in Ceramic Sculpture from Alfred University, and recently completed a 10-month program with the University of Buffalo School of Management Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership. Having been in architectural terracotta industry for 32 years, John, John's engineering and artistic experience guides the manufacturing of terracotta products for several markets while consistently expanding the state of the art uh, facility and equipment. And that gets to me. I'll actually read today. I've been a uh, practicing artist for 40 years. Um, I have made work and I've considered myself a problem solver. And as a result of that, <clears throat> out of being a tool maker and a problem solver, I love this. I've done some outdoor sculpture in which um, I, I had difficulties and had to work through those. And I'd like to show you a little bit of kind of where I went through, and these guys are gonna have a longer presentation and I'm gonna to try to be brief. So I had the chance to do a piece for the Bank of America as a really big monumental piece. This was my maquette. Um, uh, it was built uh, out of steel. It was gonna be, originally it was gonna be interior to a building and they switched their, their thinking and asked me if I could take it outside and I built these long, long leaf forms that went on this object. Some of them were 42, 46, but they were hollow. And, and here's what my thinking was. I, would, I had these posts that I would join the clay to, and these early ones, the small ones, I used urethane to fill them up. Well, that worked really well on the small ones, but some things that I ran into was the fact that when urethane is chemically combined with what sets it off, it expands. So I was, I was popping these larger objects and having to remake a lot of stuff. And uh, so I had to rethink my whole procedure of how I was gonna do this. Um, and you see that where I wound up was I basically uh, started to put a bird's nest of material and, and roll the end, these, each one of these pieces or components in that bird's nest and then drop it back over where it was connected. So the buffer was, was basically, you had hard clay, you had a soft cushion between, which was the urethane, and you had the hard post being the steel. 
and that's the way it stands today. This next slide uh, is where Brad and I actually met. We were in Korea doing outdoor sculpture for, in Incheon for the museum there. And so this is a quick thing. So we had, everything had to be fairly rapid. So this procedure was to make this piece. And you can see I'm pouring urethane down in and then using the unfurled stainless steel cable to attach. And then it's a very simple sort of direct approach, kind of hanging it over these pens. And then I believe Brad said it's still standing. Is it's that right? It's still standing. OK. <laughs> well, I'd like to hand it over to Brad Taylor. So I live in Hawaii now. Um, this image is of the sunrise on Oahu. Find where the clicker's at here, there we go. Um, this place is really isolated. It's out in the middle of nowhere, so you can get a sense of that with the mileages on this thing. It is about as isolated from a major population center as it's possible to get. And the place, the ocean, this place is just falling apart. It's amazing what the weather does. Um, I had to throw this in, so it, it, maybe it's a bit of a joke, but the, here's one way to deal with outdoor clay. It put it in a museum. Um, this is a, so this is from the Inga Museum in Taipei. Um, but I think it has a lot to do with my other work and a lot to do with weathering and tactility and the way that things change through time and entropy. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about two pieces primarily today. Um, they were both intended for the landscape and to be outside for long periods of time. Um, one of the pieces was intended to remain as permanent as possible and to really be stable. The other was intended to deteriorate through time and to change. So the first one I'm going to show was the piece that was intended to stay put. Right? Um, Superfund paid for the piece. Um, it was at this smelter site, which is in Murray City in Utah. Um, it's a response, it's a site-specific response to this, this industrial landmark. Um, these smelter towers were about 300 feet tall, about 100 meters. Um, this is my response. It's wiggly and green. Um, they're thrown in sections. Okay. I built this wheel to throw the piece. It's coil thrown. It's my wife helping me, Carrie. She's always there through all the big pieces, every time. Okay. Um, I'm going to run through how this piece is installed. I think that the, that the installation and the, the making of this has an important tie to what John and Bill are going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, this piece was, um, the foundations for it are quite deep. The, the foundations are as deep as the piece is high. So the piece is 28 feet high. The foundations are 28 feet deep. Um, this, these are those foundations in proximity to the original smelter site in Murray. OK. And what I did is I strung these things like beads over the top of these rebar cages. They're lifted into place one at a time and they're poured full of concrete. I like the orange jacket. Okay. Okay. It's clear that this thing is out in the weather. Um, it was completed in 1999 and it's been through many, many freeze-thaw cycles. Okay. Um, Salt Lake is one of those climate zones where freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw. Um, this is a view of that piece when, shortly after it was installed. And this is looking to the east. Okay. 
this is the same piece looking to the west, that same time period. Okay. Now, fast forward to now. Okay. Um, this piece has not held up as well as I would like. All right. Um, it's had some problems. And I think that especially John's presentation will talk specifically about some of the problems. Um, filling it full of concrete in retrospect was probably not the right thing to do. Okay. Okay. The particular failure here, does that thing work, the pointer? Yes, it's there. There we go. Right up in here, it's hard to see in the image. Right in there, you're looking through up at rebar. So the rebar is exposed. The rebar was too close to the surface of the concrete as I, as I fed it on, and it split the piece apart okay, as, the, as the rebar has expanded via the water, and it is starting to take that piece apart. Okay. This is probably the worst problem on the piece currently and the cracks that are extrapolating out from it from the different expansions and contractions of those dissimilar materials which are in direct contact with each other. Okay. It's another view of the same flaw. Okay. This one's kind of way up there. This one's like 20 feet up or something. And I think this flaw is maybe a rock or maybe somebody with a small gun. I'm not sure. So I need to get a lift and get up there and look at it to figure out what, what's going on with that. The man-made ends up being, the, the man interaction with man, that ends up being an important aspect to the outdoor work also, the way that people interact with these things. And sometimes that doesn't go as planned. Okay, And then the third thing that's going on with this piece is I am getting some freeze-thaw problems with this. Okay? This is clearly freeze-thaw failure that's happening. And this is the only place that I can see on the piece where it's actually taking the glazed surface off and eating back in. But it's happening now, so there's going to be more. I'm sure of that. Okay. Okay. So this image I took about a month ago. So this is what it looks like from a distance. The other images of, the, of those flaws that are developing are up close. And the opposite view of that piece approximately a month ago. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to move on to the other piece I'm going to present. Okay. Okay. This next piece is in Ichon, Korea. Um, and it was built during the workshop that Michael mentioned in his introduction. Um, this piece was intended to come apart in the landscape. Okay? It's a metal frame I, or metal drawing I laid out on the floor and then I filled this thing with clay. That's me kind of in the middle of that thing. All right. Okay. This is after that piece was fired. Um, usually after I fire, nothing fits if it's made of porcelain. So I grind and I chisel and I fit and I number and figure out how this whole thing goes back together. Then I go out and I install it. All right. So this piece was installed on a bed of stone. I was thinking about it. In ter the solution I came up with was, okay, so I have this horrible red cell that's made of concrete, and it really didn't work for me. And I thought, okay, something like a Japanese rock garden might work with this. So I chose some granite, and we bought a truckload of granite and had it delivered, spread it out, and I installed the piece on sand. So it's, 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 it's free floats on a bed of sand surrounded by granite. Okay. This is as the piece was installed in 2004. That's looking toward the town of Ichon from the hillside in Korea at the World Ceramic Exposition Center. Oops, there we go. 
Uh, okay. This image was taken about a year ago when I visited Korea again. Um, so same piece. Um, I love the way this thing has weathered. I think that the weathering on this piece is beautiful. It's so much better than when I installed it. Um, maybe the one part I'm not happy about is every time I go, I have to deal with the man problem, and I have to pick all the rock off that the kids throw at it. It's pretty, it's, it's just, they just can't resist. It's in a park, and the rocks are, you know, so the rock part I don't like. Um, but the weather is gorgeous. It's like, it, it, at this point, it's really like bone that's out in the desert. The moss and the grass grows on it. I'm good with that. I think it's really beautiful the way that those things integrate and the way that they come and they go. In a lot of ways for me too, it's like being back with my father when I was a little kid and his Cessna 185 on floats flying over the glaciers to go fishing. So I like very much that it has that kind of movement. It has that kind of erosion and deterioration. I see it as this interesting activity in relation to the piece and the way that it transforms through time. And this is a view of that piece currently as it exists. Okay. Okay. This is the sunset from Alawai Boat Harbor in Honolulu. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my interest is in ceramics as well, but it's got kind of an architectural bent on it. Um, I'd like to start out with um, this picture here because I think uh, it's kind of the, uh, the pinnacle of architectural ceramics turn of the century, who uh, Louis Sullivan was kind of the master of designing buildings and ceramics and this building has stood up phenomenal over 100 years in Buffalo, which is in a severe freeze-thaw climate. <clears throat> and uh, anybody that's interested in ceramics that wants to do outdoor sculpture, I think has really always tried to understand how do these things hold up so well and what's the secret. And in my career, we've learned a lot over putting ceramics out on buildings and in public space, and you always hope they hold up. Um, so I think we can, you guys can gain some uh, important tips from this group here today, mostly from Dr. Cardi. Mm -hmm. uh, now we've developed systems that are a little more technical, but you shouldn't be afraid of them, and it's kind of similar to what Mike was talking about with his piece that he did uh, for the Bank of America, where you try to not introduce a lot of mortar into the system to anchor it, you try to float it on some lightweight metal structure, preferably aluminum with aluminum clips. But the, the principle behind a facade or ceramics is to keep it as light a weight as possible, uniform wall thickness, and allow air movement to get around the piece and the moisture to drain out. So you really want to you know, keep all those principles in mind. But the reason why you have uh, such a, a great uh, system with these modern rain screens is the ability for the air to move around the system. Uh, recently, about five years ago, we were had the pleasure to work with Mario Bota. I don't know if anybody of you follow architecture, but Mario Bota is a, a genius in his own right in designing and working with ceramics. And this is only one of two buildings that he's designed in the United States. It's a private art gallery in uh, downtown Charlotte. And uh, it's a fabulous structure. Basically, he designed it as like a negative space. You plop a, a block of clay down and carve it out, and you end up with this wonderful geometric cube of ceramics. 
Um, but I think what makes this building so special, it kind of takes that principle, that rain screen, and then takes it to the next level. So we're concerned about how this material will hold up in the future. And we think using that system that I showed earlier, that these structures will last hundreds of years as opposed to some of the older architectural examples that we see that are falling apart today because of the mild iron and the amount of mortar and, and concrete that were packed in behind them. So we've gotten so much interest lately in designing with ceramics that we decided to create a architectural ceramic assembly workshop program uh, in conjunction with Alfred University and the University of Buffalo to try to pull together different disciplines to work together with architects to help understand how to work with ceramics in architecture and public space. And it's been very successful. Last year was our first uh, attempt at, at pulling this off. We had Dr. Cardi as a guest speaker and we had probably about five artists from around the world. Three of them were from Alfred from the graduate program and we had probably 20 architects or facade engineers from all over and it was a really really fascinating learning experience to put all these people in a venue to talk about what works and what doesn't work and how to design with the material and in our practicality of making a buck every day and uh, and trying to stay ahead of the curve we were fortunate enough to take on this crazy project up in Edmonton, Canada, where we were uh, tasked with meeting this really intense freeze-thaw test cycle. And the first person I turned to was Bill, because I knew that we were up against uh, some pretty, pretty amazing tolerances that we had to meet with a dome structure on a government building made out of ceramic that had to hold up for 100 years. And uh, it was a pretty daunting task. but. <coughs> When we got into it, we just kind of broke it down into the simple logic of, okay, why did it fail the first test and what do we need to do to improve the clay body to hold up to an outdoor freeze-thaw environment? And uh, some of the things were getting into a custom mix design and understanding how to flux the clay out at the right temperature, um, the shape and the form and how it was going to be put back together. And lastly, the structure itself, how it's actually mounted back to the, the subframe of the building to, to get it to last longer than the original. The original terracotta was unglazed and it came from England. And we were the closest source and the only person in the world that actually could pass this test. It was a, a test from Brampton Brick, but um, they just didn't have a standard for, for testing architectural ceramics for this. So we were we were under the uh, criteria for a free saw test for brick, which was pretty aggressive. So then when we got into the, uh, into the design, a lot of it was just getting into the particle size and the nature of the particle that we were using for our grog. And the percentage of that grog ratio to the clay was very important. Uh, the amount of flux that was added into that clay was also equally important. And then the firing temperature, of course, and the soak temperature were, were really big. So all these factors played an important role in passing that test and being qualified to be able to put that type of ceramic back on a dome structure and know it's going to survive. OK, so you're looking at uh, two, two diagrams. I know. Probably a lot of people don't looking at drawings here, but I don't want to bore you with it. That was the old system, and this is the new system. And uh, the old system was basically fill it solid with grout up against a backup terracotta speed tile and uh, just pin it back with soft, mild iron anchors. And that thing held up for about 100 years. It, it had gone through several repairs, but um, it's amazing that it withstood 100 years with just that older system of uh, installation. In putting the, the new dome back over here, it was actually put together back historically correct, but it was hung as a rain screen system based on that slide that I showed you earlier. And all stainless steel anchors were used. The dome was had an, about a one inch airspace between the back of the ceramic panels. 
and the uh, and the, the concrete structure. They tore the whole structure down, uh, cleaned all the existing steel, reinforced it with new steel, and then used shotcrete and built almost like a, a swimming pool with a half dome out of concrete, and then waterproof that with uh, bitumen membrane, and then put uh, one pound density foam sprayed on over the top of that to insulate it to get a better insulating value when they put this building back together and then they hung the ceramic over the top of that. But before they put that uh, waterproofing membrane on, they had to locate all the uh, anchor points to drill in for the clips. So these are some of the details that were used to put the terracotta back together. And now it became a precision game of making sure the holes in the slots were all in the same place. And everybody knows that when you work with any type of ceramic, it's really hard to get those kind of tolerances when you're making, whether it's pottery or um, some type of sculptural element, that the clay shrinks and it's not uh, perfectly predictable. So what we did is we engineered a system that um, was flexible that could accommodate the shrinkage variation. And that was the typical clip that was used to hang the pins. And then the material was pinned together with an oversized hole on one side and a slightly larger hole on the other side. And then they kind of consecutively built it in a ring working their way up. And one of the other things that we did too is we dry fit the whole thing in the factory before we shipped it out, similar to how Brad would fit his pieces uh, together on the floor. Everything was numbered and consecutively laid out. If anything was off a little bit, we would machine it with diamond tools. And then at the end of the, at the, end of the day, we had a, a low porosity uh, absorption body. The, the dome was constructed, constructed to breathe and weep and it was also engineered for thermal movement so as the thing uh, would heat up during the day it actually had the ability to expand and contract within those pins so it's not too rigid and, and it would crack. And a couple of years ago I called the engineer up and I told him I wanted to get up on the building and actually walk around the structure to make sure it was holding up all right. So we were so confident that this system works. When we went to do the close-up inspection a few years ago, it was in perfect shape. So I think this, uh, these tips that I just provided you are things that you could take uh, into account if you do a public work or are designing ceramics. You got to take all these things into account in these freeze-thaw climates, or even if it's not in a freeze-thaw climate, if it's in a tropical climate, you have to be uh, really paying attention to thermal movement and things like that. Uh, another thing, uh, we did a, a very large project up at City College in New York, and that also has a very high freeze-thaw climate. And uh, every building there was in the Gothic-style architecture, and the original ornament was all fractured and breaking up, and we were trying to get to the bottom of why the bulk of the terracotta was in pretty good shape and it just exhibited a lot of crazing or failure from the anchors rotting out. Most of the sculpture was blowing apart because it was trapping uh, snow and ice and it didn't have a place to, to relieve itself. So when we redid all the pieces, we had to take into account all the drainage off of the ornament uh, right down to providing weep holes in the piece. So, you know, when you're doing things that are three-dimensional, you have to think about how ice and snow are going to sit in there and how you want it to drain or not be, get trapped and expand and break the piece because it's just like steel. When it gets cold, that ice will grow in size. If it doesn't have any place to go, it's going to break the ceramic no matter how, how tough the body is. And then at the end of the job, you know, your, your ultimate goal is to get this thing to survive and, and go at least another hundred years. So we were able to tackle all those objectives when designing new ornament for freeze thaw uh, uh, due to you know, the ice and the thawing cycles and design the parts to shed the, the ice in the water and not hold moisture. This is one of my favorites. This is kind of like a case study. If you do a three-dimensional sculpture, this cross originally we don't know if it was hit by lightning or if it just over time it just failed from successive freeze thaws, but it had been banded in several areas and it was way up in the air, so it's kind of a dangerous spot, but think of it like a, a freeform sculpture. And I know the architect personally graduated from the University of Buffalo and it's on the Holy Rood Church in Upper Manhattan. 
And he didn't really detail the drawings very well, and we kind of went along with just copying the historic material the way it came to us. But when it all went back together, and I got a phone call about three weeks later that it's all falling apart in the middle of August, I was really shocked and let him know that I don't think it's due to the faulty terracotta. I think there's an underlying issue with how this system is put together. So do me a favor, let me come up and look at it and talk to you face to face and not get angry about the whole situation and condemn the material because it is a good build, building material. It's just you have to really know what is causing these problems when you get into this type of work. So on the right, he specified high strength grout that was 9,000 PSI and the terracotta only had an average compressive strength of about 8,000 PSI. So right away, the grout is actually stronger than the terracotta. And then you have a one inch solid stainless steel rod embedded inside that cross and they packed it solid. So when that rod heated up, it's got a coefficient of thermal expansion about five times greater than the terracotta and the grout. And you have three dissimilar materials all coming together here. As soon as this rod got hot from the sun, it expanded and broke everything. So it was just a classic mistake. So here's some of the cracking that we saw when we got up there. So we, we uh, suggested to the architect, just take it down, we'll redo the whole thing and we'll get it right. And we'll detail it for you and let's just keep an eye on it. So we, we went back to the drawing board and we sketched up a, a detail where it required minimal grout, uh, leave as much air space as possible. You can see these little weep holes in here and then we weeped it at the bottom using a rope weep. And we wrapped the metal in a, uh, a waterproof membrane that's about an eighth, eighth inch thick to accommodate for that thermal movement when it heats up and expands. And then we put very little grout. Anyway, we, we use very little grout back in there and you can see the rope weeps that uh, we put in there, so whatever grout did go in, there was a, uh, a weep to allow for any drainage of moisture did get in. And that cross has been up there for about 20 years now and it's holding up great. So that's a really cool test, you know. Now we know how things work with architectural ceramics. And then later, we have a lot of fun with working with clients. Um, this is a private residence. It's a barbecue pit, it's kind of funky. Um, it uses the rain screen principle. It's got a cavity wall system behind it, it can breathe. And now you don't have to be afraid to put these things up. You, you have to partner up with like a structural engineer that can help you uh, hold the weight of some of these things. But um, there's a lot of these guys out there and you know, if you just call me, I can refer you to a bunch of these guys, but it's really not that difficult. It's, it's all how you put it together on that backup frame and how you clip it. And then um, just lastly, we get into our high performance systems. When you're working uh, with large architectural work or any ceramic sculpture, you usually have to feature a lot of webbing in the material. So the trick is to, to keep the webbing as thin as possible, uniform wall, wall thickness. Uh, and we even feature these nifty little holes here that help in the drying, that deflect the uh, drying tension when you're making rectangular parts, that helps a lot. And then these are um, a couple cross sections showing the uh, assembly of some uh, modern facades that we're working on that are very sculptural. And you can see the image on the left is a aluminum system that we offer with our product. The architect designs the material and then we kind of give them a turnkey solution on how to put the building together. And the image on the right is one of the largest rain screens that's currently being built in the United States. It's called One Vanderbilt Place, right next to Grand Central Station. It'll feature glazed ar architectural ceramics on a 67-story high-rise, and it's currently uh, in production right now, and that's the mock-up that is being, that was put together for the architect to view. And that features a completely open joint system. It's designed to handle the uh, snow, the wind, the rain on high-rise construction. So um, don't be afraid to work with the material outside. I can tell you right now the material is making a huge comeback and 
people really enjoy seeing it on buildings. Um, so the, the trick is to, uh, develop a denser uh, freeze thaw clay, you know, just play around with your existing mix, flux it out a little more. You might have to raise the firing temperature a little and get that particle size just right. You can perform some of the testing up at Alfred at the CACT um, if, you, if you need to make sure you're getting your absorption right. Um, you always want to design for reduce inconsistencies or inhomogeneities. Um, keep everything uniform, wall thickness, lightweight. Uh, don't pack it with mortar. And make sure you have a good engineered structure for thermal movement and expansion and drainage. And then at the end of the day, you should be able to walk away from projects like this, and these things should go. You know, people ask me how long this is going to last, and I said, look up the Ishtar Gate. That's over 2,600 years old. So there's no reason why these type of structures can't last that long if they're properly installed. And a lot of people think I'm kidding, but there's, you know, the backup structure will probably fail before the ceramic fails. So that's just a little taste of what's going on out there. So, um, you know, don't get... Uh, demotivated from public sculpture. Keep up the, the work. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, the idea for this panel on outdoor sculpture bodies, um, we've been kicking it around for about a year. And the issue is um, there's a lot of information in the literature that uh, I don't think makes a lot of sense, which is unfortunate, I think. Um, there's a couple of examples here that I uh, pulled out. This is a sculpture that sits in front of a house on Main Street, or on uh, Church Street, actually. And the foot has uh, broken off in freeze thaw. And, and just to give you a little bit of a perspective, this uh, picture was taken Tuesday morning before I got on the plane. So we still have snow, <clears throat> but then it is Alfred after all. Um, the middle picture here is, um, is a, a piece that we did freeze thaw testing on, to, uh, actually trying to find failure in the piece and um, it seemed to work. Uh, we got it to fail after about 50 cycles and I'm gonna talk about that, about the testing itself. So, so we're talking about outdoor sculpture, right? Um, the first thing is location, location, location. Right? And there's some really cool information out there uh, that tells you it's remarkably consistent about like, where you are in the country. And then uh, how does ice actually form in these structures, which is really cool. And I have a reference for you that you can go watch. Um, I'll talk about it. A guy named George Shear gave this talk in, in 2008, American Ceramic Society. Brilliant lecture. Um, it's available on YouTube or whatever, like everything else today. And then how do you design a body potentially to uh, deal with freeze thaw issues? So when I get into location, um, the issues are that, that the United States actually is pretty easy to find information about this. Um, there are maps uh, of the US. And they are designed, actually, they're used by different groups. And so I have three of them, one from the concrete industry, um, one from agriculture, and one from the IECC, which I had to look up what that meant, uh, International Energy Conservation Code, um, and they're just great maps. Here's the first one. I like the concrete guys, if you will. Really simple approach. There's three zones. And um, so, so then the question is, is it really a simple approach or is it something else? And, and what it is actually is, is they actually look at the problem in, in a uh, a more complicated way than we typically do. So they don't just look at freeze-thaw cycles, they also look at how long is, the, is it below freezing. And, and, and that's the thing that we haven't really addressed in, in uh, terracotta uh, in any of these uh, forms because, but you know that if, uh, you know, like where I live, right, in, in Alfred, um, in the fall it starts snowing and no one cares until the ground gets cold enough for the snow to stick, right? So it can be well below freezing, but the concrete the roadways are still warm. So, the, so this takes into account that uh, aspect of the, for the concrete industry. And then um, I like this one. It's a plant hardiness map. Um, you know, we, we live up here in this really uh, great place to plant in June. All right. 
Um, but it gives you the zones of the country. And, and if you look at the zones of the country, they're based on temperature, average temperatures and temperature ranges. Um, and then this looks very similar to the next map here, which is the um, IECC. And uh, I really like this map. They have, uh, there are seven zones visible, and then they say that Alaska is zone eight. Um, uh, high, uh, high, uh, Hawaii, excuse me, is zone one, although it sounds like that may not uh, be quite the right way to look at that. Um, what you're seeing here is every county in the country has been evaluated and given a code, and there are three zones in general. Uh, this is the moist region of the country, the dry region, and then the marine uh, areas on the side, and then they have different requirements for that. But they've done a pretty extensive job of trying to figure out how you insulate your home in different places, and we can use this information then to understand better. Okay. Now, this guy, um, by the way, if we look at Canada, you know, if you uh, live in Canada, um, uh, you're all zone seven or eight, something like that. <laughs> so, um, there's two ways to look at the climate data, right? Uh, freeze thaw, number of times that the temperature drops below freezing and then comes back up above freezing. And, and that's typically what people refer to. And then the second is how long, like the concrete industry, how long they refer or they look at how long it gets cold. And they have really complicated, uh, complicated or thorough reasons, uh, ways of looking at that. And I found this great article actually on freeze thaw cycles, um, Journal of Applied uh, Meteorology, um, 1974. And, and this is great because this is all pre-computer and this guy compiled, Hirschfield was his name, he compiled uh, data from weather stations all over the country. So there's another map that goes with this that has dots all over it, which is where all the weather data came from, which is really cool. But then he, from that information, he put these contour lines are, which uh, lines on, which you can't see the numbers. It's not much better in the article itself. But basically, um, you know, for example, this is 60 freeze thaw cycles, this is 80, and then it goes up. And then you get into these regions in the mountains, you can get 200, 250 freeze thaw cycles in a single year. So you should think about that if you want to put outdoor sculpture in those locations, right? Um, but it's, it's a great map because it shows now this information about you know, where you're going to put sculptures. And I'm going to come back to this in a little while. And then in a separate article, not in this article, but an article that looks at uh, stone uh, for exterior applications, uh, there are freeze thaw cycles by location, 140 in Denver, Denver 140 freeze thaw cycles per year in Denver. Uh, 96 in Chicago, 76 in Minneapolis. So you think about that and you go, well, wow, Minneapolis, right? But what happens is it gets below freezing and stays there, so you don't have a cycle until it rises back up above freezing. So you have fewer freeze thaw cycles, but it's colder for a longer period of time. <clears throat> We're someplace in that uh, uh, 75 to 80 freeze thaw cycles a year in, in Alfred. Um, Atlanta, Georgia, 37, and if you're unfortunate enough to live in Texas, you have seven freeze thaw cycles a year. I know I'm going to hear about that later. <laughs> so the thing is that, that um, how ice actually forms in these structures is, is um, fascinating, for one thing. And then how do we do the testing and the evalu evaluation? And there's two aspects of this that cannot be ignored. One is you need to understand the water absorption in the body. And, and you have to be careful in how you interpret that. Uh, setting a piece out and putting water in it and deciding that water didn't seep through the body is not a good test, okay? And the other thing is that there's, they, they do what's called a saturation coefficient, which I'm going to get to in a minute. I don't care for it, but they'll soak the body in cold water or at room temperature, you know, fine, okay? Um, and then you do a boil test, and, and boiling is much better. And boiling is what you should do. But I'm not going to be able to change the standard, but that's the way it is. And then we do the freeze thaw testing. So <clears throat> ice formation. Ice crystals, OK, ice crystals are cool. And what happens is it will nucleate in one location, and then that ice grows. And it will grow into huge crystals. So <clears throat> um, you're driving down the highway, and you hit a patch of ice. Chances are there's only a few crystals, but they're maybe two meters in diameter. Right? And they'll nucleate in one place and they'll grow until they impinge upon another crystal. And what happens is that water will get cooled below the freezing point and then it will spontaneously crystallize. And so this guy, um, George Shearer, who's now at Princeton, or I think he just recently retired from Princeton, he gave this spectacular lecture, invited lecture, it's called the Delaroy Lecture, 
um, 2008 American Ceramic Society, and it's videotaped, but it's called Understanding Frost Damage. And you go to ceramics.org and you can find it, and uh, it's free. Um, but he did these great tests, and one of the things he did was he took bricks and he put them in, a, in an environment where he could take the temperature of the water, uh, take the temperature of the brick below the freezing point of water without forming ice, okay? And what he did then was he would touch an ice crystal. This is my representation of the brick, okay? This is why I'm not an artist, but, okay, what you have are these green regions are then structure and the blue represents the pores. And what happens is when you touch an ice crystal, he had put thermocouples in the brick, and you touch an ice crystal to the side, and the ice forms through and ignores the structure around it. So it runs into a, an obstacle, goes around the obstacle, and is back together as the same crystal of ice moving through the material. So it actually is, and he has, the, by putting the thermocouples in, he could tell when that freezing front hit, and he could map that this was a single crystal of ice that would form in these bricks. Okay, that should change the way we think about freeze-thaw damage in outdoor sculpture bodies. Because it's not this idea of, oh, I got a lot of ice forming. You have typically one single crystal of ice that forms and then pushes through that material. Oh, and by the way, um, ice expands is 9% expansion by volume over, over water. And everybody goes, uh, goes into that and it's like, and I, my take is sort of, okay, so what, right? So what we have is for testing, there are two test standards that are available. And the first is ASTM C20 is what it's called, and there are a couple of others that are the same thing. And it's how do you measure water absorption and, and density by what's called immersion. Some people incorrectly refer to that as Archimedes density, but it's the same idea. You're gonna look at the amount of water that the piece picks up. And that's a water absorption test. That one is very reliable. And the second is ASTM C67, which is a brick standard, actually designed for bricks. And what it does is it, it looks at freeze-thaw. There's a bunch of other things. There's how to test the strength of bricks. There's also, uh, they do this saturation coefficient thing. Okay, so what you do is you, um, my equations disappeared. Oh well. Um, <clears throat> what you do actually is you boil this in water. Okay, and, and, you, and it's better. So when you boil in water, you put the sample in water and then you bring the water up to a boil and you're, ideally you boil it for five hours. Now, you can skimp on the five hours because it's done in about 30 minutes. But what happens is that when you heat it up, then the air in the pores expand and then the water replaces that air. And when you do it in cold, what happens is that it will come in from the outside and it traps air in the middle. So the cold saturation test doesn't tell you the actual water absorption value. And then if you have a bigger sample, you're gonna get a smaller uh, value and that misleads you in terms of the performance of the material potential performance. Okay, so uh, the ASTM study, and unfortunately I don't have the saturation coefficient, I don't know where the equations went. Um, they look at the ratio of the cold water test uh, to the boiled water test and they come up with a ratio. And then they get really excited about the ratio. I think it's a waste of time. But it's the standard, so you have to adhere to the standard. The boiling water test tells you what you need. And where you're at is you would like these bodies to have typically less than 6% water absorption, and I would actually argue for less than 3%. That's why you all came here, is to hear me say just that, right? <laughs> so less than 3% is where I would go. There's another aspect to this that becomes interesting. And so when you do the freeze-thaw test, you saturate with water, you stand up and then in a pan of water, saturate the brick first, or the piece, and the brick sizes are about four inches square is what they like, about an inch and a half wide. That's ideal, they'll do a whole brick if you want. You stand it up in a half an inch of water so it's always in contact with water, and then it goes in the freezer. It's supposed to freeze for 20 hours, and, and I can't make the math work out because there's only 24 hours in a day. And then you're supposed to thaw it for four hours, but you gotta do other things in between, so we certainly run out of time in the day. Um, and then you repeat. An ASTM, T67, calls for 50 cycles. And I would argue that's not enough. And we do a lot of testing for, um, for John in Boston Valley Terracotta, and sometimes the architects refer or ask us for 300 cycles. So, which is fine. Uh, five day work week, you can do the math, okay? 300 cycles is gonna take you some time, right? Um, almost a year, actually, about a year. So we actually devised a faster test and we could do two cycles in a day. 
because you have to freeze it, it has to be completely frozen, then you have to thaw it, and it has to completely thaw, and then you have to freeze it again, and you can do two cycles in a day. And then you evaluate periodically. Uh, weight loss, you look for breakage, you know, chip the corner or um, a spalling or whatever, and then cracking, and you record that, and if you have weight loss, you record it. We did a bunch of these. So we worked with Boston Valley, and um, it took us uh, a little longer to get things going than we thought, um, and we ran out of, of um, uh, ran out of time to do everything. Here's our freeze thaw test. Um, bodies sit in the water, and then they go in the freezer. We have a couple of big freezers, works great. Then they come out, and what we did was we set up a, um, um, a uh, water bath, basically, to, uh, to circulate, to thaw these things out faster. Okay. So, body design. If possible, eliminate open porosity. That's the porosity that opens to the surface. That's how water gets in. Okay. And then water adsorption is that best test. That's the boiling test. And it's the weight increase due to water at the end of this process, right? And then there's an issue with, we're seeing a lot more paper clay. And paper clay, I know that you love to work with it, and it works really well for those applications, but for outdoor sculpture bodies, it's really an issue. And the issue is that you end up with these, what we call inkwell pores. And I'm gonna show you an example of that. Water travels into the pores in the pockets, and then sits there. And then what happens is when it freezes, it has no place to go. So you can ratchet open these, these pieces by having these types of pores. The other problem is that, that uh, paper clay gives you the perfect shaped pore for failure, okay. impressively. So this is an ink, what an inkwell pore is, is basically that, that you have a, this is like an old uh, you know, historical inkwell. So it's not, it's, this is the pore, but it's connected to a small channel to the outside. And this is actually a paper clay, and you can see this pore in here. And, and the structure is great. There's a hair diameter, if you have an idea of scale. This is a honker pore, okay? And the bigger the pore, the better the potential for failure, okay? So what you would like, if you're gonna have pores, make the pores spherical, okay? Circular pores are best. But if you have an oriented pore, which is what you would get out of paper clay, but also sometimes by hand forming, you'll get layers, and those layers, the pores that you generate, are the absolute best for failure, okay? So <clears throat> what happens is that it will, it will create, it, it's what's called a stress intensity factor. When you have a pore of this shape, it concentrates the load at the tips, okay? And then what happens is that crack propagates. So if you were to create the perfect shape pore for failure, it would look something like this, okay, or more like this. Okay, so these are in a, in a body that, um, it was a terracotta body, and these elongated pores, this is, these are awesome for failure, okay? But the problem is, right, their orientation. So now the orientation becomes critical, and because the material is pressed into a mold, and it was not Boston Valley, by the way. Because it was pressed into the mold, these pores are now all uh, parallel to the surface. So that means your potential for spalling is excellent. Okay, and it will chip that clay off because it gets water in there and then it, it's ratcheting those pores. They're waving at me, they tell me I gotta shut up, but <laughs> it doesn't make a difference. Okay, so here's, um, <clears throat> here's the paper clay. These are the same magnifications, just different size images. These, there's a hair, so these pores are absolutely immense, right? And they're absolutely, like I said, perfect for failure. And you can see the striations here in the clay, this is from paper clay. What you'd rather do is something like this on the left. Yeah, we've got a pore in here, but you know what's different about this pore is it's not connected to the surface. So you don't care about that pore because you cannot get water into that pore. You can't get water in that pore if you boil it in water. It will not go in, and therefore, there's no stresses associated with that. And then higher magnification, and you can see some of the striations that are present in paper clay. So I'll show you some freeze thaw damage that uh, we did. These were great. 9% um, water um, it was the water absorption value. 50 cycles, that's less than a year. And um, this is actually the water absorption data, and it was this sample up here. These samples down here, we haven't managed to get to fail yet. Uh, they're still being tested, and, and it will go on for months, because it takes a long time to do the testing. Um, Boston Valley Terracottas for that Canadian project, uh, they were down here, less than 3% water absorption, in order to, and they had to do that to pass the freeze-thaw test, okay? 
Um, this is that microstructure of this region, and, and there's, this is a hair, so you have a lot of open prostate and open prostate corrected, or connected. Now, the thing is, if I take that 50 cycles and I put it on this uh, map, um, we would hope that your sculpture is located under the red line. So, because otherwise, it will not make it through a single year uh, outside. Okay. Now, we've learned something else. If we can make it through 300 cycles or even usually 150 cycles, we don't see failures. Okay. But the 50 cycle ASTM test is too short. It needs to have a, a, a larger number of cycles. So, and the last thing is the myth of glaze. And, and I run into this quite a bit. Um, you put a glaze on the pot, and that makes the surface then impervious to water, which is great. But the problem is you can never actually make a perfect surface, and water will always get in, and that piece will fail. So putting a glaze on makes it look nice, but it doesn't solve the freeze-thaw problem. You have to eliminate the open porosity in the body, uh, and that's the way that you have to go. So a little water absorption is perfect. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. If you have any questions, if you'd please uh, uh, go to the mic and uh, address the, our panel here. I'd be glad to answer a few questions. Uh, terrific. What does de-airing contribute to um, uh, the porosity question? So in other words, uh, mixing of clay, what's the, the, the role of that in reducing porosity, if any? I think I push. Is that working now? <laughs> um, De-airing clay, what it does is that, that when you have a lot of porosity in the body, when you have air pockets in the body, they create pores of the perfect shape, right? So what de-airing does is it tends to improve the way the clay knits together prior to forming. So you end up eliminating these large pockets in the clay. And so um, electrical insulators, for example, all the clay is de-aired, vacuum de-aired, and then you get a much denser body. And then you, in, in the firing process, you know, you don't have these pockets left over that end up um, being, you know, permanent, if you will. Does that make sense? Particle packing is important for everything, Neil. <laughs> Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, Tracy, South Florida. Um, I'm, you, you spoke about particle size, and um, most of the sculpture clays that we're building with uh, for sculpted tile, murals, or outdoor sculptures have a, such a variety of grog and particle size. I was wondering if you had had specific mesh sizes for <laughs> grog or anything, or what type of grog, or if that comes into uh, the clay bodies that you prefer. When you're, can you hear me? When you're working with uh, the architectural bodies that we were featuring in, in the testing for the Alberta Dome, um, the size was really important. I think uh, our smallest grain was either 20 or 18 mesh, and uh, we, we wanted a variety of, of particle sizes, so we found an 1880 mesh worked well, so you had a good distribution of sizes, um, and the pore sizes, uh, so the, the ratio of the, the grog to the clay was really important, too. I can't remember exactly the amount, but it was more like a 66-33 ratio of clay to grog with a, with a high flux content, a lot more than what we were used to and a higher firing temperature. So we normally fired a cone four. We were going to a hard cone five and soaking it for like an hour and a half versus 45 minutes. Okay. Thank you, guys. And if, if you want to approach some of us and ask questions as we're leaving, we got a next group coming in pretty soon. Thank you so much for coming and listening to us talk. Thanks to the rest of the panel. <laughs>